let's now, I mean, it's pretty easy to do uh, comparing Hinduism and Buddhism together, but when we start looking at the two traditions that we were looking at before, right, in the first section, in the first unit, um, how do we find some places for this comparison? How do we, how do Hinduism and Buddhism relate to Judaism and Islam? We would probably immediately think it's just too great, there's just too much of a difference. But I think that there are some important places to, to find some commonality. First of, all, first of all is the importance of practice. In all of the four religions we're talking about here now, right, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Islam, there's an importance given to ritual and ritual practice. Right? Doctrine and beliefs are important in many of these traditions, or at least sub-traditions, but not as important as the ceremonies. Now, even the secular, humanist, even the Reconstructionist Jews still look to certain ceremonies, certain practices, as having a lot of importance and meaning, even if that meaning is only cultural or ethnic. And, and certainly, you know, in Islam, there's a lot of beliefs that are important, right? That there's one God, Muhammad is the the prophet of God, uh, you know, the revelation of the Quran, but there's the five pillars, right? And so a lot of your day-to-day -day life is shaped by ritual practice. A second place where there's this commonality would be in the issue of ethnicity or family. As most religions do, the four that we're talking about here pass along down family lines. There are strong ethnic and family ties in these traditions. Now, Islam, compared to the other three, explicitly tries to rise above this. Right? Islam explicitly tries to be a religion that is more universal, more global, right, more diverse. But certainly as those cultures are assimilated, those families pass on their ideology. And so there's more ethnic diversity in Islam and Buddhism than there is in Hinduism and Judaism. But that also could be because of the fact that Islam and Buddhism tend to be more missionary religions, especially Islam, than Hinduism and Buddhism are. There, there isn't that push in Judaism or Hinduism to try and convert people, although certainly you can convert. Another place of commonality or, or, or places where we compare these two sets is the diversity. Right? The Sunni Shia, you have Orthodox Reform, uh, you know, uh, Quartaran talks about the uh, Shivites and the Vishnavites, right? so the people that devote themselves to different deities, Theravada, Mahayana. Right? The, uh, there's a lot of diversity in these groups, and they look at diversity in different right, ways. Some are tolerant of diversity. Um, others look at diversity as being a bad thing. That, that there is one way, right, a true expression of the religion, and others are, are false. And then a final comparison, I think, would be the philosophical or theological traditions that exist within the history of these groups. That although the very first one points out right, practice and the importance of practice, all of these religions have had a strong philosophical or theological set of traditions. Right? These schools of thought of people who were deeply devoted to, um, you know, what does what do we believe about the self? What do we believe about the nature of the universe? Uh, you know, what is it to be right with God, or what is it to be right with uh, the world around us? Now, one of the things that, of course, a philosophical or theological tradition represents is the notion of luxury. In order to spend time meditating on the nature of a self, you have to be able to spend time meditating on the nature of a self, right? If, if you have to be working two jobs just to make ends meet, right, or you have to work long hours in order to... Uh, you know, accomplish all that you need to do to survive, you don't have the time to sit back and think, 
what is a self truly? I mean, you're trying to think, all right, I need to get these crops harvested, or I need to, you know, get this project done by the end of the day. And so the philosophical tradition tends to be one that mostly elites follow rather than something that is common across traditions. And so only a few people end up in these philosophical traditions, but it's something that shows up in, in all of these traditions. So, although it's, it's quite obvious the differences between these groups, there are some places where there's, there's commonality. Why is there commonality? Why do we find in these quite diverse traditions, right, monotheistic traditions versus polytheistic or even pantheistic traditions, why, do we, why, why might we see these places of commonality? Especially between some of those regionally, they're so close together, and they have, uh, you know, they influence each other in that way. And over time, I'm sure ideas have been taken from here to over here. You know, when you think about it, uh, while there's a lot of differences in religion, religions have some end goals that are quite different. I right? think you know the whole purpose of Islam, what you're trying to do in Islam, is quite different than what you're trying to do in, in Hinduism. But still, that idea of there's some common human problems. Right? There, there are things that are quote unquote wrong with the world, right? and so you know as, as religions are trying to address these things that are out of sync or wrong in the world, they're going to they're going to end up addressing some things in some similar ways. Right? There's there's a commonality in human existence, right? and and so how we live as human beings is very similar across ethnic, racial, religious ties, right? You know, the living in family, existing in community, right? There's sociological similarities across uh, different traditions. And so we shouldn't be surprised that there would be common places, even though we're talking about some quite different traditions. But it's certainly the, the differences that are much more obvious especially the one at the top, monotheism. You know, I mean, we did mention that there are some traditions of monotheism in Hinduism. Right? Hinduism is so diverse that we can't exclude monotheism. But in general, Hinduism allows for polytheism and has many traditions that are polytheistic. And even the monotheistic traditions in Hinduism allow for the possibility of that one deity appearing in different forms, even as other deities. Right? Krishna is an avatar of Vishnu. Right? So supposedly they're the same being, but people will worship Krishna right? and exclusively devote themselves to Krishna. Right? And so there, even the monotheistic traditions have these components that allow for polytheistic types of ideas. Now, of course, in a sense, uh, we can certainly look at the Israelite tradition in the Bible and look at, you know, um, prior to uh, Abraham, uh, even prior to the Exodus, and even in the land there was a lot of polytheism. Right? I mean, that's what the prophets continually railed about, uh, you know, and why the kings ended up in so much problems is that here was polytheism. After the exile, however, the Jews apparently had no problems with polytheism. Polytheism seems to have been eliminated from the Babylon, through the Babylonian exile. Right? They learned their lesson through them right? and developed into a monotheistic tradition. 
uh, even though, of course, the law, uh, you know, it, God's own views of that were, you know, that you should be a monotheistic, right? You should have no other gods before me. The experience of Judaism, well, the Israelite religion, uh, up through the exile, was one of polytheism. Uh, Pre-Islam Arabian had a polytheistic past. And so, yes, there's polytheism in the traditions, but when Islam fully comes into existence, it is a monotheistic tradition. It is an absolute. And in fact, even when Muslims were in control of India and some of the surrounding areas, they persecuted polytheists. Right? So there's a very strong opposition here between monotheism and polytheism. Another important difference is the role of texts. Most forms of Judaism and Islam emphasize the importance of texts, right? the Bible, the Quran. Now certainly there are forms of Judaism and Islam where the textual part isn't emphasized as much. Right? So Sufism isn't as much about the text. Right, the Quran. Uh, certainly, there's there are some places, but but even Sufis, even you know other Jews that tend to emphasize practice, would say there's something important about the Hebrew Bible. And Muslims would say there's something important about the Quran. Uh, Hindus and Buddhists have texts, but they don't have this kind of central text. They're not considered the same way as the Bible and the Quran are considered. Right, so the importance of the textual tradition in Judaism and Islam make it an important difference from Hinduism and Buddhism. Exclusivity. Certainly there are traditions in Hinduism and Buddhism that are exclusive in nature. That they would claim this is the only path to liberation. But in general, in these traditions, there doesn't seem to be the idea that there is one and only one path. Most Hindus, most Buddhists would allow for diversity. Right? There are multiple paths to God. And while there would be modern Jews and Muslims who might hold that idea, historically, Jews and Muslims have been very emphatic that their way is the correct way to God. Now, yes, there is the notion in Islam of the peoples of the book, right, that the Jews and Christians share a spiritual heritage, but in general, there is this idea of there is something exclusive about Islam. You must practice Islam in order to be right with God in, in their mindset. Right? There is only one way to God. And even those traditions that allow for the possibility of multiple paths, they would still claim that there are that their form is the highest form of truth. A final place of contrast would be the importance of history. Now certainly Hindus, Buddhists, especially those that are westernized, would, would look at history similarly to how a lot of other westerners would look at it. But as far as the tradition of Hinduism, the traditions of Buddhism, a lot of those claims aren't based on any sort of historically verifiable or historically reliant claims. So, if the Rishis didn't actually hear the voices of God when they wrote the Vedas down, and if you can't pinpoint exactly when that took place, that's not as important. Right? Even the Buddha himself, in a lot of traditions of Buddhism, isn't that important. There's a saying within Zen Buddhism of, you know, if you meet the Buddha by the side of the road, kill him. The idea being that if you're too focused on the Buddha, you are too attached to the things of this life. You are not going to experience liberation. 
Right? So, you know, that notion of the historical nature of the Buddha, for some traditions, it doesn't matter whether the Buddha was a historical individual or not. I mean, he was. But for the sake of the tradition, it's not important. It doesn't matter. But in most forms of Judaism and Islam, the historicity of Muhammad, the historicity of Moses and David and some of those other people is very, very important. And certainly the claims would be that if these things didn't happen, then the religion in its entirety is false. Right? So history takes on a different role. And, and similar things would, of course, be claimed by Christians as well. Right? If Jesus didn't actually live and say these things and rise from the dead, then it's, it's not valid. Right? Similar things would be true of, of uh, Muslims and Jews. Now certainly, again, right, there are some that... There are some Muslims and Jews that would deny the need for historicity, but historically, this is a very important concept. Questions or comments about any of these comparisons or, or contrasts between the traditions we've been looking at so far? Let's begin to think now and begin to talk about Differences between Christianity, or, or comparisons with Christianity, differences with Christianity, and in, in Hinduism and Buddhism. When it comes to thinking about communicating the gospel, right, sharing the gospel message with, with a Hindu or a Buddhist, there are probably some ways that we can think of almost immediately where there would be problems in communication, right, difficulties. What would be some of those ways? What are, what are some of the things within Hinduism and Buddhism and even Christianity that would be immediate challenges to try and, and share the gospel with a Hindu or a Buddhist? Yeah, the whole idea of, of God versus gods or, you know, and trying to, you know, make that distinction. What else? Like the whole, like the process of like being, what your life can, can become, like what you're living for, like the end goal. All right, so the end goal, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say, you know, I mean, if, if you've lived your entire life thinking your goal is to be liberated, right, and to kind of fade into the universe, right, to try and, and talk about, no, your end goal should be like, heaven. Right? So immediately there's that kind of difference in what's life for, where is it going. What else can you think of that would be a challenge for a Christian trying to communicate with a Hindu or a Buddhist, or trying to share the gospel with a Hindu or a Buddhist? Talking about how we are saved. All right, so the process... Right? If you're, you know, and a lot of these traditions allow for diversity to try and claim, right, there is one way and only one way, uh, let alone the idea of salvation. Right? That kind of gets back to the idea of what's the end goal, what's the, what's the purpose. Other ideas? I would say it's going to be difficult to, to, uh, to argue the uh, commitment aspect of it because, I mean, for them, they meditate for hours and their whole lives are based around their faith, even in their society is based around their faith. First of all, our society is not closely based around our faith. Besides Chick fil A closing on Sunday, we, we just don't uh, focus that much on, on our beliefs. So why should they listen to someone who's not going to? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's certainly, you find the same kind of. Um, Issues within these religious traditions that you find in all traditions, right? There, there are some people that are just culturally right, uh, a part of that tradition. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a challenge in any time you try to communicate with uh, someone outside your culture. Uh, you know, and because of that you know, close connection between Christianity and American culture and, and, and the, the assumption that uh, that when you think America, you're thinking Christian when you're looking outside, right? and the outsiders think. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Any other things that you can think about that would be immediate challenges in trying to explain the gospel to someone? It would be tough to like, 
tell them that we're not trying to avoid suffering, we don't get away from sin. Okay, yeah. so sin and suffering, or you know, what's the what's the basic problem in human life? 